turn the mic on. Yes, on. Good morning, everybody. My name's Lorna, and I'm an alcoholic. And I've already started off with an adjustment. I'd like the lights to go up, because I can't see you, and um, I want to be able to see you. Ooh, there you are. Um, good. Otherwise, it feels like I'm on a Broadway stage doing a performance or something. Um, anyway, let me start off. Thank you so much, John. Let me start off with... Uh, remembering my manners and thanking the committee so much for uh, choosing me to be a speaker. And I know that you, know, you have a, a choice of many speakers and it's not lost on me what a privilege it is. Um, and uh, I want to thank John for going to the effort to do all this and my, my host Brenda and especially to David here who picked me up at uh, it wasn't Cincinnati, it was Louisville, right? Louisville Airport um, yesterday and drove me here and we stopped at Keeneland on the way and looked at that. I, at this late stage of my life, and I've just taken up horseback riding, so <clears throat> I've gone, I'm going through a stage where young girls go through in their early teens, I think, and I've become equine obsessed and um, I'm just, I'm staying on in Kentucky for a week after this conference to ride. I'm going to be staying with my friend Peggy, and I just want to take riding lessons. I'm, and I, I mean, isn't God sweet to bring me to Kentucky? Um, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful, and I'm really looking forward to this conference and uh, to being in Kentucky. And, and also, um, I, want, I didn't get a chance last night, but I want to thank John so much for uh, the talk last night. It was really, really moving. And this one's going to be uh, completely different from last night. I must say I'm impressed. I thought there'd be eight of us here this morning. But we're all here. I would like to say that, you know, when I first started speaking, I used to think and I used to say, I hope there's something I can say that's helpful to you. I hope you are able to get something out of what I have to say. And, I realize now that I'm not here to help you in any way, shape, or form, because that would be a little arrogant of me to think that I could. Um, I'm here because God obviously thinks I need an awful lot of help. And um, I get to come and tell my story and hopefully have myself reflected back so that I can establish, you know, deeper and deeper how reliant I am upon you. So, I guess the thing to do is to be kind of classic and talk about my experience, strength, and hope. So let me start at the end of my uh, drinking. Um, my story can really be summed up with missing. Just missing out on everything. Just never quite getting it uh, together. For instance, When I was in my late teens, I, I, this is a British accent, actually. I thought, you, it's not a West Texas accent. Um, <laughs> where I grew up in England, uh, there was a little place nearby called Richmond. And on Sunday evenings, there was a, a in the station hotel, we used to go and dance uh, to this rock and roll band. And the leader of the band was rather sweet on me. And I just didn't really want anything to do with him at all. And um, the name of that group was the Rolling Stones. And um, I mean, you know, it might not have been a great love affair, but it would have been something wonderful to have in my resume. Uh, um, but I just missed out. At the end of my drinking, I uh, was, I, uh, I met a gentleman this morning and he reminded me of something I often talk about, about uh, dis in describing the end of my drinking. I had no great crash and burn. I was like a plane coming into, its, uh, coming into land and its landing gear fails and I just belly flopped along the runway for a long time 
and all my undercarriage got scraped and the wings were torn off and the passengers were strewn all over the runway and there was you know suitcases and underwear hanging on the bushes and things it was just kind of messy and Toward one of the months leading up to the end of my drinking, I was in London. I, I worked, um, I had a very highfalutin job. I was uh, the first woman art auctioneer in America. And uh, I worked at Sotheby's and I had this very prestigious job. Anyway, I was in London and my company was having a big uh, ball at some fancy hotel in London. And Lord and Lady Duwa Diddy were there, and uh, you know the directors of museums, and the, all the directors in the company, and people that were big collectors and that. And I was there, and I, while they were dancing, I was going from table to table. I mean, I was all in a gown and done up like a dog's dinner and all that, and I was going from table to table, emptying their glass into mine. And something struck me. I thought, you know, my behavior doesn't quite go with my outfit. But, or my position in the company. But, you know, I just thought, like, oh, they wouldn't understand. And it's me, after all. And Anyway, that was in the summer of 1976. And in 1976, uh, America celebrated its bicentennial, and I was, uh, I live in New York, and I wanted to come back to New York, ex it was in early July, uh, late June rather, I wanted to come back to see the tall ships going up the Hudson, because it was a huge bicenten bicentennial celebration in New York, and of course, all across America. And I was in the middle, or at the end, or at the beginning, I don't know, of some tawdry love affair. You know, we never are having a wonderful love affair at the end of our drinking. I mean, it's always, you know, we're never going out with the cream of the crop, let's face it. Um, so I was very, um, I'd gone off to Paris to meet this fellow during this trip to London. And I mean, it sounds very glamorous and jet setty, but believe me, it was really sordid. And I came back to London, and I was with my parents, and then I wanted to come back to New York. And I, the taxi came to pick me up to take me to London Airport, and my father was standing at the garden gate waving goodbye to me. And I was so wrapped up in myself, self, self, me, 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 that and my tragic life and my tragic love affair and all that. I couldn't be bothered with my father. It was like, yeah, yeah. And it was the last time I was to see him. He died very suddenly. And that memory, you know, I missed out. That memory fills me with regret. And they say that we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. I regret that. I regret that I didn't have time for my father. But that regret makes me constantly is just on the back chambers of my mind. And I can access it to make sure that I greet and part from people in a non-casual way. That it is not casual. I am not guaranteed that I will see the sunrise tomorrow. I am not guaranteed that I will see you tomorrow. Um, that you will be here. So mm, it's, a, it's a painful memory and a good memory to have. Um, I came back to New York, as I said, expressly to see those tall ships going up the Hudson River. And I live on Manhattan Island. I live on a piece of land that is surrounded with water. And I had no idea how to get to the river. It was beyond me. Yeah. I can auction millions of dollars worth of art, but I mean, I could have walked out of my apartment and turned left or right, and eventually I would have hit a river, but I just couldn't do it. I just, it was like beyond me. It's like, how do people go skiing? How do they get those things? And 
poles and the hat and all that. It was just beyond me. And uh, the whole of America was celebrating, and I missed the entire bicentennial. I spent it by myself, in my apartment, drinking and feeling sorry for myself. And, um, you know, I'm 30 years sober, and I'm really, in the last few years, really getting in touch in a very deep, radical way, the depth of my isolation. And isolation isn't just about not having people in my life, it's a choice. I mean, here I was in a very public job. I was 30 years old, and why didn't I have anyone to be with at the Bicentennial? Why didn't I have anybody? But I can remember being eight and nine years old and being exactly the same way. So um, anyway, this was all part of my belly flopping. And um, one day, I, I, I had been married, by the way, and this uh, husband had finally walked out the door. And I thought it was the most fascinating thing he'd ever done. You know, it really <laughs> caught my attention. And I wanted to get him back very badly. Meanwhile, I was having an affair with this other, the Paris chap. And uh, I, um, I was naked in a sauna one evening. And one of the women uh, turned to me and she said to me, you know, Lorna, last night I went to this meeting called Al-Anon. And all the women sounded just like you. So, and then she started talking about alcohol and alcoholism. And I, things started working in my mind. And the following day, the following night, I was in a meeting of Al-Anon. And it was suggested that one go to open AA meetings. Now, after this meeting of Al-Anon, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that my husband was an alcoholic. <laughs> I knew. So I thought, well, I want to go to open AA meetings to find out how the dear one thinks so that I can get him back. So the following evening, I did something that I was to repeat for quite a while. Right opposite where I worked, uh, it was on Madison Avenue in those days, was the Carlisle Hotel. And there was a, a bar in there called Bemelman's Bar. And I like to drink on an empty stomach. You know, I like to fast all day and then uh, have that first vodka on it, because it's like vroom, you know. I, um, so after work, I went into Bemelman's and I started drinking with my friends. And then it got to be almost 7.30 and I said, ooh, it's almost 7.30. I'm going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll be back. So. Um, I toddled up the road to this meeting uh, called Lennox Hill. And Lennox Hill in those days was really the silk stocking, blue blood meeting of alcoholics. And all the doctors and the lawyers and the Park Avenue dames and all that were there. And it was an open meeting. It was three speakers. And I had checked it out beforehand that I, it was all right for people like me that were not alcoholic that could go to this sort of a meeting. So I'm in there, I'm sitting down. And this chap gets up on the stage, much like I am now, and he says, good evening, my name's Don, and I'm an alcoholic. And I can remember thinking to myself, well, good God, we don't all want to know. I mean, um, you know, surely there's some things you keep to yourself, really. Don't you have any pride? Um, does your mother know? Um, so. But anyway, he went on to tell this fascinating story. And I'm laughing and, and sad, and I didn't understand that was called identification. And then after he sat down, two other fellows got up and told equally as fascinating stories. And I want to say here now that I think that that is what qualifies me as an alcoholic. I think if one comes to these rooms and likes to hear about stories about how 
you know, we were crawling on the bathroom floor and vomiting on our clients and, um, you know, we were contemplating suicide or matricide or something, or we were, um, we'd lost our jobs and lost our families and uh, um, woke up in bed with strange people. And we find that interesting. There's something the matter with you. you know? And not only do I find it interesting, I like to get on the phone and talk about it after all these years. I'm still finding it interesting. I like to go to endless meetings and listen to more stories about how people contemplated suicide. I like to get in coffee shops and talk about it. I mean, it's endlessly interesting to me. So, you know there's something not quite the ticket um, with me. Anyway, after the meeting, I went back to Bemelman's and what did I know about anonymity? What did I know about the sacredness of anonymity? I thought it was a jolly good job that you were anonymous. I mean, after all that you got up to, it was quite right that you'd be anonymous. But pff, it had nothing to do with me. And so, anonymity to the wind. You know, I told them everything I'd heard at this meeting, and I said things like, well, you'd never guess who is an alcoholic. <laughs> and, um, you know, I talked all about details. Anyway, it had interested me so much that I kept on going to AA meetings, open ones, of course, ones that I was allowed to go to. And um, so it continued uh, all through that summer. And um, the bottom came for me was one Sunday morning, I had a brunch date with that chap from Paris. Uh, he had come, returned to New York, and um, I got up in the morning and I fixed myself a carafe of vodka and orange juice, and I poured myself a tumbler full of this concoction. And as I started drinking it, I remember looking at the glass and thinking, good God, I'm drinking in the morning. This is a morning drink. And you know, it is said that the beginning of wisdom is to call something by its correct name. And I had had a drink in the morning many, many times, but I'd called it brunch, I'd called it toasting the bride, a gallery opening, um, Wednesday, um, <laughs> You know, <laughs> summertime, whatever. Um, I lived in Spain for a short while and I had cognac in my coffee every morning and I called it being continental. You know, I never called it drinking in the morning, but this particular morning, some kind of health, some shaft of reality broke through the thick, thick denial and clarity was revealed and I said this is a morning drink and right on the heels of that possible enlightenment the disease whispered and said oh, Lorna you know the sort of woman you are the kind of job you have to hold down just the you of being you why do you make life so difficult for yourself why don't you need a little help why don't you do this every morning before you go to work? And I remember thinking to myself, you know, that's a jolly good idea. That's really right. I should do this. Why do I make life so hard on myself? So with that kind of awakening for myself, I could not release the glass from my hand. And I got in the shower, and I'm trying to hold it out of the spray while I'm soaping myself down. I could not put the glass down. I went and I had brunch with this fellow and I had much more to drink and I ended up on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I was just talking to Bruce before, you know, I remember speaking in the South before and one chap came up to me and he said, oh lady, I don't know, he said, it's very difficult for me to identify with someone that had their bottom on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But anyway, um, I'm sitting there on the steps, I'm 
not drunk, I'm not sober, but I've got a lot of alcohol in me. And the mind is hazy and thick, and it's hot, very hot. And, you know, all of life is going on around me. I can see people coming into the museum, and the families, and the children, and just life. And I knew it, but I couldn't get to it. I just couldn't get to it. And I, up until that moment, I'd never felt so isolated and alone in all my life. And I felt far worse in sobriety, but that was some real painful, ooh. And I remember standing up and not knowing what to do with myself. The brunch I'd had with that guy had been a disaster. We'd argued, it was messy. And um, I stood up and this voice came to me and said, go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I ended up at a meeting downtown and a woman started speaking and she didn't look unlike me, I mean, in build. And she had broken capillaries all on her face. And um, she started telling my story up to where I was at that moment. And then she went on for another 15 years. And a great moment of grace happened for me. I got to see very clearly coming attractions. I got to see there was absolutely no difference between myself and that woman. That it was only a matter of moment by moment by moment by moment. And it would go like that. And if I lived another 15 years, I would be just like her. And you know when you're 20, or say you're 15 years old, you can't, I mean, 60 seems like, like just ancient, you know, just so far away, but boom, you're 20, boom, you're 30, boom, you're, you can't, it, but you can't see it. It's very difficult to grasp future. This was a grace that I was able to grasp this future for myself. And um, I knew that it was me, and I remember being so frightened. I remember sitting there and saying to myself over and over again, oh my God, I drink. It's the drinking, I drink. It's not the family, the country, the husband, the lover, the job. It's not my weight, not anything, I drink. And um, I, I'm in these rooms because I should be in these rooms. And the idea and the re revelation was so horrific to me that I ran out onto Lexington Avenue, went into the nearest bar, and knocked back a few more screwdrivers. <laughs> and, and that evening I went out and drank some more, and I, I got home, and um, the next day I woke up and I was in a, and I, that evening I walked into a meeting of AA and I um, said I'm here for myself. And 10 days later, I was in Washington on business. And you know, just because one comes into the program doesn't mean, and one has a revelation like that, doesn't mean to say that it was all revealed to me. It was not all revealed in one great, uh, you know, clarity moment. It's a process. And um, I was in Washington on business, and after the business we were at a private home, and there was a, a small dinner party. There were about eight of us at dinner, and uh, wine was served in these great goblets of wine. And I didn't know enough, I didn't have enough within me to say no thank you, or to uh, turn my glass over, or to remove my glass, or ask after it had been poured for the glass to be removed. I thought, and if anyone is in the room is new, listen up. I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was to teach me how to resist alcohol. I thought I was here to learn how to develop tools and strengths that I could resist it. I didn't understand the whole concept of surrendering to the powerlessness over alcohol. You know, the first step is I take the first step on an extreme basis. 
It's, it's not something I did, it's something I continue to do. I think it's the step, a lot of people say it's the only step I can do perfectly. Mm -mm. I think it's the step that is the continually, continually being revealed to me, the powerlessness and the surrender to the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. So anyway, I resisted this wine through the salad and through the main course and through dessert and then they're all sitting around chatting over coffee and whatever cheese and crackers and this goblet of wine started to talk to me and it said to me oh Lorna you know you're always so damned extreme you always go overboard what on earth are you doing in Alcoholics Anonymous for your simple problem you know you, you don't have a problem I'm on your side. Don't you always feel better when we're together? Don't you always feel prettier and that you're able to speak better? Now look at the other people at this table. Are they weeping and telling each other inappropriate details of their personal lives? No. You know? Are they acting out? No. Why can't you be like them? Why do you always have to knock it back? Why can't you just sit? And I said, you know, you're right. I really have overreacted and I'm always a little too dramatic. And I put my hand around that goblet of wine, which by now had become sacramental liquid, and I took a sip of it. And that sip hit my soul and my soul went into utter terror. And whereas 10 days before, I'd been drinking, drinking, drinking all day and it hadn't done anything really for me, this sip of wine. And it's funny, isn't it? When people get to this point in their story, they, you know, here it is. It's all these years later and it's still like, ooh. This sip of wine revealed to me. But what it didn't, what it did was that it... I could feel the doors, these huge, huge doors or gates, solid, coming across the film of my life. And they were going to lock shut with this great thud. And I was going to be on one side, pounding on the doors, and you were going to be on the other. And it's not that you wouldn't let me in, it's that I couldn't make myself heard. And it was so terrifying to me. And um, I know from my own direct experience that it's not how much we drank. It's what the drink does. Because my last drink was a sip of wine. And um, I came back the following day on Amtrak and I wept literally wept for three hours all the way back and um, I begged God please don't cut me off please don't let me be out there please include me and let me be in AA and uh, I went back I threw my suitcase in my office and I went up to that meeting called Lennox Hill and I went and sat in the first row trembling and really upset and some chap came up to me and he said, you can't sit there. He said, you know, Harriet and Henry or whatever their names were, he said, they've been coming here for 20 years and they always sit in those seats. And he said, and you can't sit here. And I don't know where, how I got the strength to claim my place, but I said, I don't care who sits here. I'm here now and I'm not leaving. And um, I haven't left and that was 30 years ago. And I, but I want to say I have sat in different seats. And... Um, <laughs> It's one of the tools I want to get for, I don't know anyone's uh, routine in this room, but if you go to a meeting and there's a, a seat there and they say, oh, that's, that's Joe's seat or that's Susan's seat, change it. Do not have a seat that's your seat. If you're, if you're always seeing the meeting from one place in the room, it's an it's a indication of how you're looking at life 
move to a different part of the room, see the speaker from a different part of the room, change. If you can't change a bloody seat in a meeting room, God forbid, what else uh, is going on? So, um, uh, so, I, um, so now I'm in AA and um, there's so much more to talk about and you know my time is very limited but um, just a few stories I <laughs> I really want wondered how you knew I was new I um, you know I had these when I first used to speak I used to at the end of my talk, I used to think to myself, good God, the next time I speak, I must get my story straight. And there's no getting it straight because it's constantly being revealed to me in a very different way. But, you know, I had such dichotomy of feelings when I came in. On one hand, I thought that you took a look at me and you whispered among yourselves and nudged each other and said, oh, thank God Lorna has arrived because now we can hold our heads up high. We don't have to be quite so anonymous because she adds great tone and class to AA. <laughs> and, you know, she is going to lead us out of the darkness of anonymity into the light of publicity. And uh, meanwhile, you were tapping me, you know how you do, you were tapping me and you were saying, you keep coming back, sweetheart. You're in the right place. And I don't know what it was about me that revealed I was new. Maybe it was because I'd been wearing the same dress for the past three months. I had one pair of shoes. You know, it's, and it's not that I didn't have other clothes to wear. It's just that I couldn't be bothered to put another outfit together. And I was, I had gobs of makeup on, just gobs of it, and I, I couldn't be bothered to take it off every night. I was like Elizabeth I, I just put more on every day. And I was festooned with jewelry, and I had piercings long before it was popular. I, I managed to get away with just four holes in one ear, uh, um, but I, I often say how grateful I am that I came in before the uh, the trend of tattooing and piercing became popular because I know jolly well I probably would have had the last supper put on my chest or you know, the whole crucifixion scene or something. And you know, I wouldn't have been content with some dainty little thing in the side of my nose. I probably would have had a plate in my lower lip or something like that. So I was saved. But um, you know, I just, this, the, my appearance was really bizarre. And, you know, here I had this very big job. And they, I think it was just this accent, actually, that carried me through for a long time. But um, my sponsor knew she couldn't talk to me about drinking. I couldn't grasp my drinking story at all. And people often talk about themselves in a negative sense, saying, oh, I was in such denial, or they'll talk about someone else that they're in such denial. That is the nature of alcoholism. We are not, it does not allow its victim to see that it has this problem, or it's not revealed to one. So I just couldn't see it, but this is what she said to me. She said, Lorna, if you stay with us, and you stay away from one drink one day at a time, you will be able to develop a life that will be like having a quiver of golden arrows on your back. And when you come into a situation in life that you're not too sure how to handle, you'll be able to reach back, select the perfect arrow, put it in your bow, and hit bullseye every time. And this idea of hitting bullseye every time was so intoxicating to me, so wondrous to me. I was never right. I never felt right. I never felt appropriate. You know, alcoholics are always whining. They were saying, oh, I never felt like I fit in. Well, we don't. 
And um, that's why we feel like we don't fit in. We don't fit in. And this whole idea of feeling like I fit in was just wondrous, to be appropriate in the world, to dress appropriately. You know, I always had these loser phrases like, well, that's just the way I am, or that's the way I always do things. I mean, you know, that's a real. So I, um, this whole notion of being laughing appropriately, dressing appropriately, speaking appropriately, doing my work appropriately, being in the world correctly was just wondrous to me. Now the flip side of this, as one gets more sober, the flip side of this aspect is, now, you know, I'm sober long enough that I don't care if I cause a lot of controversy, but I have found for myself the pain and the danger in lengths of sobriety comes in being dissatisfied when I think, well, I have what the world judges as correct. Why am I miserable? Why is, am I dissatisfied? And um, I have to learn over and over and over again that I am different. I am not like the rest of the world. There's something about me that's radically different. And that difference is I've been raised from the dead. I, have, I am the container of a very powerful message. I can, you know, a lot of you know that I was very friendly with Mother Teresa. And she was fascinated with Alcoholics Anonymous, fascinated. And I would often say to her, you know, you sure you don't have a problem, mother? You know, um, she always wanted to talk about it. And she was fascinated because she had success with every form of suffering human, but she could not help the alcoholic. And she could not help the alcoholic because she didn't have the words of everlasting life that you and I have. And those words are, I know how you feel, let me tell you what happened to me. So, you know, I am different. I'm not, and I need a different type of food from the rest of the world. I walk, I walk in the world differently. I'm not to be found in certain places. And there's something about me that's just different. And if it's not different, if I don't keep that difference, how will I be a light shining in the darkness? How will anyone notice and say, there's something about that woman that I need, that's a beacon that I need to go to. There's something about her. If I'm to be found in bars, if I'm acting like everyone else, uh, what, what, what's the difference? If the difference isn't coming because I'm wearing some medallion around my neck or doing something else, that's not my difference. My difference is what, how I exude in the world. So anyway, um, I, you know, my, my, uh, I don't have time to go into it all, but uh, sobriety for me, it's, it's almost like you said to me when I came in, Lorna, look, you can have this drink or you can have the whole rest of life, the whole bouquet of life, with all its possibilities, all its joys and its sorrows and its ups and its downs and its tragedies and its um, uh, victories, or you can have this drink. And I'm thinking, well, can I think about that for a minute, you know? Um, but I chose this. I chose life, or it was chosen for me. Really, it was chosen. I didn't do it. It was chosen for me. And with life comes the whole package. And I want to say that, you know, when I was 15 years sober, I went through one of the worst hells I've ever known in my life. I went, the big book flew out the window, the sponsees became my sponsors. I just was in absolute agony. And um, at one point, I took myself off to Calcutta 
to be with mother and I, I, th I had known through the program that working with others was the antidote for pain. And this was a pain that far outweighed uh, my thing of how it works. So, uh, I, you know, but I was getting envious of the lepers. I thought that they had it better than me. It was just very dire. And of some months I, after I came back from Calcutta, mother was in New York and we met and she asked me, how is it going for you? How is it? How are you doing? And I said, mother, it's hell. It's absolute hell. And she said to me, she said, how God must love you. She said, but he is a jealous lover and he is burning out of your soul everything unlike himself. And I thought, well, gee, that's just swell, you know, but um, I wish he'd stop loving me quite so intensely here. But it's true, and I want to say this, uh, that, you know, I had up until that time a lot of spiritual grandiosity. I thought, this is what it says in the book, and this is how it is, and I had really, if I really radically did my first step and radically did the program, I had turned to a book for my answer. And you know, I know that there's a lot of people in the program that are like gung-ho about this book, which is a phenomenal tool for Alcoholics Anonymous, but at the begin, but at the foundation of every radical movement, every um, fundamentalist movement is a book. Whether it's the Quran, whether it's Mein Kampf, whether it's the Bible, whatever it is, there's a book. And it stopped me from surrendering in a more mm, way to God and to let my life be led. It was like, well, it says this on page da 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 of this book. And I had to learn. People often say, how did you get out of that pain? Well, I didn't get out of it. There was nothing I could apply. If I could have applied something, it would mean that I knew how to do it. This is what you do. And until I totally surrendered, and it took four years, until it was all surrendered out of me, I, you know, um, I often say that I was in the desert, and I did not come out of the desert. God came into the desert and bought me out. And um, until I was just flopped, you know, if you're saving someone when they're drowning, if they're struggling, you're both gonna drown. They have to be totally surrendered into your arms to swim them to shore. And um, so uh, 15 to 20 years was a radical turning point in my life and my sobriety and learning this, you know, I often say you should have gotten me to speak when I was two years sober because then I could have told you exactly how it worked, exactly, um, you know, what God wanted and didn't want. But now I have absolutely no idea. Um, the, uh, I just have a few more minutes, but I want to talk about... Um, Having a radical kind of sobriety. I'm writing another book actually at the moment and I want to emphasize this part of it. I want to emphasize, you know, that it's not just about being sober, it's like in a mystical adventure that we can have. Um, there's a wonderful phrase that's by Cousin Succus, actually, and he's the guy that wrote Zorba the Greek, and he says that choosing the sure thing is treason for the soul. And each one of us, at some point in our daily lives, and at many times in our lives, we are standing at the pinnacle, and we are the the sensing rod for this spiritual journey. And it might be, shall I pad my expense account? It might be, shall I have this extra marital affair? It might be, whatever it is, you know, it might be something very minor. But 
it's, we have that choice. Which way will it go? Will it go towards the light or will it go towards darkness? And you know, this gift is not given to me for myself alone. I am not given sobriety for myself alone. This is not about me and my happiness and my welfare. And so when we're standing and we're the sensing rod like this, heaven never forces itself on us. Heaven always holds its breath. And, um, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm very fascinated with the life of Christ. And I often think when Mary was visited by that angel, she also was there, which way will it go? Will I say yes or will I say, look, you know, can you come back next Wednesday? I'm not too sure, I want to discuss this. And we stand there and heaven never forces itself. And when the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree uh, 2,500 years ago, he could have gone back to his palace. He was the son of a prince. He could have, but no, he sat. He sat and he understood and he gained enlightenment and a lot of, uh, you know, the millions of people have been able to follow his path. And two, 500 years after him, there was another man who was in the Garden of Gethsemane. His name was Jesus and he could have he could have said, you know, it's getting very hot here. I, I think I'm going to nip back to Galilee, get out of here, and uh, have a regular kind of life. But he didn't. He just kept on going forward, one full step in front of the other, in front of the other, and let life be revealed. And choosing the sure thing is not usually comfortable. It's usually very awkward and sometimes painful. And you know, 2,000 years after Jesus, there was another man who stood in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in Akron, Ohio. And there was a bar at one end and there was the church directory at the other. And here, if you and I had seen this young man standing in that lobby, would we have been able to look at him and say, whoo, I am witnessing a huge spiritual moment in the annals of mankind. You know, no, we would have seen some guy in his late 30s, mid 30s, you know, probably in some shabby suit. We wouldn't have taken any notice of him. And there he stood. And based on Bill Wilson's decision, you and I are here today. And he didn't choose the sure thing. The sure thing is, let me get out of this god awful day, let me go and have a drink. And I often think, you know, where would we be if Bill Wilson had had a successful day? I don't think we would be here, you know. And then, um, some years ago, uh, Mother was very ill. Mother Teresa was extremely ill, and I dashed off to Calcutta. We thought she was going to die at that time. And um, I was taken from the airport to the hospital and I get into this hospital room and it's a very narrow room and mother's laying in bed and she's propped up on her pillows and just very shortly after I got there a young Indian priest came in to say mass and they set the table up that set up for the people to the patient to eat off and they put it at the foot of the bed and he sets it up for uh, the altar and he's saying mass and then, at the time for the communion comes, and he comes around the side of the bed, and I have to squash like this, and there's another sister standing next to me, and he dips the host in the chalice of wine and gives it to Mother, who takes it very reverentially on her tongue. And, of course, I'm next. And the thought flashing through my mind was, oh, God, not here. Don't let me have to make a fuss here. Don't let me have to bring all the attention onto myself. Here's this saint dying in bed next to me. You know, just take it, Lorna. Just this once, take it. It's the blood of Jesus. Just take it. And um, then, you know, it's that, that sensing thing. Heaven never forces itself. And then all, I got the vision of the thousands that have gone before me. And the millions that will hopefully come after me. And it matters what I do, hidden or otherwise, it matters greatly 
what I do. My life is not my own. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and it matters what I do. And I said, no, 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 I don't want, please don't dip the host in the wine. I just, so anyway, he's very confused. He gives the host to the sister standing next to me and then I ask for the dry wafer and he gives me that. But anyway, then he goes around the other side of the bed to give communion to the other sisters. And um, I'm standing there feeling very shaken, very awkward, like, eh, you know, I always have to bring attention to myself. A mother's hand comes across the covers and she takes my hand and she leans into me and pulls me down and whispers, well done, you must continue to protect your precious gift. And I'm telling you that, you know, you and I have a precious, precious gift. And I was, not that you need to be told, not that, but I need to be reminded. I was in the art business and I often think, you know, if the Metropolitan Museum of Art had called me and said, Lorna, you know, would you take care of this Van Gogh for us or this Rembrandt? Um, we don't have enough room and we'd like you to take care of it. Would I put it in the garage? Would I stack it in the bathroom somewhere? No, I'd put it in the most fabulous place in my house and I'd probably alter all my furnishings to suit this painting, this one work of art. And I'd invite people over to take a look at it and I'd really take care of it because I know that it's not mine and that it has to be handed on to future generations. So, um, you know, it's the, the, I think the most important piece of the literature in the program the most important piece of literature, and actually it's my prayer, is the preamble. I think, it is, I think it's a piece of, it wasn't read this morning, but it's a stunning, it should be up there with the I have a dream speech and the Declaration of Independence and the, it, the Gettysburg Address. It is phenomenal. This, the way it's praises, it tells me what I am, who I am, who I belong to, what my purpose is in life, and how I support myself. So, um, you know, some years ago, I wrote a book, and it's all about me. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's about my spiritual journey and uh, all that, but anyway, um, I never knew where this book was going to end up. I just sold it word of mouth only, and I never knew where it was going to end up. And at one time it ended up on death row in Texas, and I was the spiritual advisor for a young man that was executed a few years ago. And I was there to witness that execution. It was probably the most evil thing I've ever seen in my life. But it was very, um, there was nowhere else I would rather have been on that Tuesday evening than with him, knowing that there was a very fine line between me and him. And it was just the grace of God that I was not strapped to that gurney. Um, then I, um, but anyway, I was, um, the book was, got into the hands of a woman who was a hermit at, um, living at Christ in the Desert Monastery in Abaco, New Mexico, and she started writing to me, and we corresponded, and I, um, then she invited me to go and visit her. And I mean, how often does one get an invitation from a hermit, I ask you? So, um, of course I went, and I had the most marvelous time of one Easter with her, and when I came back, mother had died the previous year, and when I returned, um, the Missionaries of Charity, which is Mother Teresa's order, uh, had contacted me and asked me if I would submit all copies of my correspondence with Mother for the cause of her beatification and canonization. And so I was delighted to do that and I wrote to Sister Joachim in the desert and I said to her, you know, I've been asked for my correspondence. All the letters Mother sent me, I've been asked to submit copies of them for the tribunal. And she wrote back and she said to me, I'm praying that you get called as a witness for mother's canonization. And I thought, that poor old dear has been in the desert too long. You know, I mean, really, the sun's gotten to her. And I thought, you know, mother and I were close, but I mean, that's a totally different category. But lo and behold, a few months later, I come home and there is an envelope in my mailbox 
uh, with a letter requesting me to give my testimony for this uh, servant of God, Mother Teresa. And I did all that. I, I went off to Rome for the ceremony, and it was absolutely magnificent. But I want to say to you that when I came into the program, you promised me that life would be beyond my wildest dreams. And I thought wild dreams meant money, men, and mansions. That's what I thought, you know? And being a witness, I mean, you're looking at Lorna Kelly, Alcoholics Anonymous, witness to a saint. I mean, I feel very 14th century. But anyway, this process was nothing to do with me. And it made me so happy to be called as a witness for mother. No matter what I think about the Catholic Church and sainting and all that sort of thing, got nothing to do with it. But it made me so happy to be such a small cog in a much bigger wheel. And it was nothing to do with me. It wasn't about my canonization, although. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, you know, beyond our wildest dreams, I realize what it says is that it will be, be beyond your wildest dreams. Beyond your tacky, wild dreams, Lorna. <laughs> beyond your self-centered, me, me, me desires. Because wild dreams are always inclusive. It's always about the other, always. We cannot have dreams and the fulfillment of dreams unless it includes the other. And all the things that make us really happy are always about blessing us all. What blesses one, blesses all. So, I want to thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak. I want to thank you so much for going to meetings, for doing service beyond David has even helped me with my iPod situation. Um, the, um, for putting money in the basket, never, ever, ever let the basket pass by without contributing. If you don't have money, throw your watch in or do something, you know. Um, but all the hidden things that one does for doing the literature, for the signing here, for everything that does to keep the body, the communion of Alcoholics Anonymous together. Because if you weren't here, I'd have absolutely nowhere to go. And I doubt that I would have died because I was very healthy, but my life would just have been a continuing of the steps of the Metropolitan. So, I want to thank you so much for your sobriety. Thank you. <laughs>